Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to start this evening's webinar while we have everyone rolling in. Um, but welcome. And I'm Zoe. I'm a campaign manager here at Virtual. And before I introduce Amit from Vegan Food Hub, uh, I would just like to quickly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, which Virtual is based on, which is the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And we pay our respects uh, to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, these webinars are a fantastic opportunity to learn so much more about the incredible businesses on the virtual platform and hear directly from the founders. And this evening, you're joined with Amit Tamari, uh, Tawari, pardon me, um, the founder of Vegan Food Hub. And um, yeah, you'll be learning a lot more about the business and the investment opportunity that's coming up. Um, Mitt's going to take us through a presentation on the company and then we want to leave the rest of the evening open to answering any questions you may have. Um, and there is a Q&A box for you to submit those through. So please feel free to do so and also um, upvote any ones that you would like answered as a priority because I'll be filtering through the ones that are being upvoted most. Um, yeah. Very quickly, um, if you're not familiar with crowdsource funding or what Virtual does too, I really encourage you to head to our website and try and learn a little bit more about investing through crowdsource funding. It is a little bit of a different beast from traditional investments that people are familiar with. So it's really good to become familiar before um, you make an investment in a company and know what you're signing up for. Um, but yeah, it's also a fantastic opportunity to invest in innovative and small scale and startup businesses um, like never before. And we're really trying to democratize helping, you know, these new businesses get ahead and make really cool things happen. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to a minute and then we'll have a Q&A session after the presentation. Great. Thank you, Zoe. And yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Um, so this presentation, I'm going to kind of run through for like 20 minutes or so, um, which is going to be about the vegan food hub. And obviously I know people have seen the pitch video and have probably read a bit about us. And I'm sure we've got some customers here, um, who might be members of the vegan food hub and they might know a little bit about it, but, um, I thought it'd be a good idea to kind of run through the whole thing, um, just from scratch. So people know, okay. So the vegan food hub, um, so I've got, you know, multiple brands, one central hub, and we've got our brands that we currently have underneath. So we've got Soul Burger, which is obviously the, uh, you know, the, the the pioneering brand. That's the brand that kind of, you know, has is basically the crux of everything. You know, it's it's where I kind of started my whole journey, and it's you know, it's it's the it's the cornerstone of what we're doing. Um, uh, but it's it's one of our brands, and since then we've actually also began trialing in delivery only formats: uh, Planters Taqueria and Zainas Lebanese. And we're also currently building a brand at the moment called Poke Away, which is a plant-based um, Pokeball company as well, Pokeball brand. So um, that's uh, that's the vegan food hub. Um, and it's it's the, I think the best way to think about it is it's an umbrella company that owns uh, restaurant QSR concepts underneath it. So if you think about maybe if you think about you know if there's a company that owns different hotels or you know, I guess Maryvale comes to mind in terms of a company that owns different brands and restaurants or different bars and restaurants. I think the best way to think about the vegan food hub is it's an umbrella company that aspires to build um, different QSR restaurant concepts um, under different cuisine types. So our vision uh, for the vegan food hub is, yep, again, creating compelling vegan quick service brands nationally under the vegan food hub umbrella. So this is the interesting slides, um, our approach. So um, I talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the fact that the Vegan Food Hub is this umbrella company that owns the brands underneath it. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about our approach towards actually, uh, you know, building out these brands and, and the kind of strategy that we're going to use in order to make it happen. So um, step one for the Vegan Food Hub is creating a lead brand. Uh, with multiple stores and a mass following. So really you can't you can't build, you can't have an umbrella company that owns brands without actually executing a brand and actually executing a concept properly. So um, the example we're going to put here is Soul Burger. So this is the lead brand. So we've we've built Soul Burger to a a real kind of a, a really well-known brand. It's a it's a brand that's got great kind of recognition all around Sydney. Um, New South Wales and even beyond interstate in Melbourne and Queensland. We've even had people from the US and UK 
um, and you know a different countries actually come in and and they just know that Soul Burger is like this plant based burger brand, and that's because um, you know we were um, the first sort of vegan um, burger burger joint at the time. Um, and so we kind of had a lot of, I guess, um, media attention, that kind of thing. So we've, we've kind of built that brand. We've honed that reputation over sort of eight years now um, with, you know, developing, a, you know, a real following of customers. So that's, that's really kind of step one, like create the lead brand, build multiple stores, you know, create the product that actually resonates with customers, learn the lessons on, on what restaurant ownership and management actually is. And that's, that's really what we've done. So we've got Randwick, Glebe, Newtown and Parramatta at the moment. Um, which is four restaurants, obviously. And, you know, the goal is to to grow Solberger out as well um, throughout Sydney and, and interstate as well. But um, it is it is one of the brands. So that's that's the lead brand. So that's step one. So I've, put, I've given myself a sort of tick here and said, yep, we've done that. We know what we're doing there. So step two, after we, we've we built Solberger is um, is really creating, is, is getting the Vegan Food Hub multi-brand ordering loyalty app developed. So I talked about the Vegan Food Hub as the umbrella company that owns the brands that um, that are customer facing, like Soul Burger and Planet Stackeria and Zana's Lebanese. Um, but the other way, the other part of Vegan Food Hub is, or the VFH, is that it's actually a, a membership ordering and loyalty platform as well. So um, you can actually download the Vegan Food Hub app or the VFH app, and what that allows you to do is what we've what we've sort of had developed is that all of our brands are actually in that app. So what we want, what we want customers to do is to be able to order delivery pickup or, or even dine in by QR code scanning or via at the app um, through that one app. And the advantage of having that multi-brand sort of ordering app is that you can get loyalty points across the different brands. So if you spend a dollar with Solberger, you actually get a point that you can redeem towards uh, Plantis Taqueria. If you spend a dollar with Plantis Taqueria, you can redeem, um, you can redeem a point, you can redeem the points towards Zena's Lebanese is for next time and so the loyalty part is um at the moment we've got i think it's like 70 points you get like small free fries 140 points you get either a zanus kebab or a planet's tequeri burrito or a soul burger so the idea is like we really try and encourage um you know that sort of cross-pollination between the brands so that if you do spend at one brand you get to kind of redeem rewards from another brand so um that's the real that's the other kind of thing i guess to think about with the vegan food hub so it's this umbrella company that's the actual the actual company and then the other sort of iteration of the Vegan Food Hub is the membership and loyalty app, um, which holds all the brands underneath it. But you can see here, so you can see it says like Planet's Taqueria, Soul Burger Glebe, um, and, then is, and then we'll have Zayna's Lebanese now as well. And then when we have the when, our, when we have Pokeaway as well, it'll come out with Pokeaway as well. Um, and the other key feature about the app is that, or the online ordering store as well, is that you can actually order delivery through this as well. So, um, you know, when, when you know, we, we are going to build QSR restaurant concepts. And if you're going to build QSR, and by QSR, I mean quick service restaurant concepts. If you're going to build QSR restaurant concepts, you need to know that delivery is just going to be part of your life now. And it's going to be a bigger and bigger part of your life. Um, I, I would kind of equate it a little bit to like, if you're going to own like, you know, a nightclub, like alcohol is probably just going to be part of the business model that you're in. Um, and, and maybe music as well. And for us, I think if you're a quick service restaurant, you, you really have to nail delivery and you have to own it and make it a profitable part of your business. And so that's the other big feature of the Vegan Food Hub app is that, um, you know, we we the app that we've had developed integrates directly with DoorDash Drive, which is the white label version of DoorDash. So we have access to all their couriers. And there's actually an integration happening with Uber Direct as well, which is the white label version of Uber. So what I mean, what I mean by they say white label is that it doesn't happen through their marketplace, but rather... Um, we there's an there's like an API integration with the app and and Uber and or, or DoorDash and their couriers will get binged when someone orders delivery from the Vegan Food Hub app or the online store. So those people, so those couriers will come in, they'll collect the food and then they'll deliver it. And the customers will actually get a very comparable experience because they'll see GPS trackable delivery, they can track the delivery. Um, they'll be able to um, submit support requests. And we've actually got like an on, on demand phone number as well now. So we've got like a, we actually rent um, the support service from DoorDash so that they actually answer it and as, as you know, by saying, hi, the Vegan Food Hub. And then they'll actually have a matrix where they can issue refunds and credits and things like that. So the goal really is to make the Vegan Food Hub um, delivery uh, portion com competitive and comparable with Uber Eats, um, DoorDash, and, and Menulog. Um, and then we've got future ideas for how we can make it even more compelling. Um, one of them 
um, that we really want to pull out, um, put out soon is being able to order from different brands through one order. So, um, you know, for example, if someone wants to get a burrito from Zainas or a burger from Soul Burger and then maybe churros from Plantis, they can get it all through one order. Um, and, uh, and then the other piece that we're really trying to do as well is roll out a membership model. So you can essentially become a member of the VFH. You can, you can sort of a little bit like Uber one where you can pay a fee. So I'm, I'm not sure what that fee is because we'd have to do like the price modeling on it, but you know, potentially something like nine ninety nine a month. And, and by paying that fee, you might get subsidized or free delivery, you know, for all your orders. Um, so again, thinking about how we can just convert as many kind of delivery customers from aggregators to, to being our customers through our app. Um, you might be wondering why it's so important to me. Um, you know, as I said earlier, you know, if you're in the QSR business, doesn't matter if it's you know vegan, non-vegan, whatever. Um, you have to you have to embrace and really nail delivery because that is the way the rest of the market's sort of moving and how they consume food. Um, and so this this way for us is a way to do two big things: one, avoid thirty percent commissions, which is what every aggregator essentially charges, and the second thing is to keep um, your customer data. So. A lot of restaurants are completely reliant on third-party aggregators, and um, that's really quite scary because there could be a time where those aggregators, you know, start maybe going into partnership with other restaurant groups or build their own ghost kitchens, and you know, you would have no idea why your customers aren't ordering from you anymore because you don't have any of the data. You can't market to them. You, you don't see what they're doing. You can't see how they're spending. So that's why for us, we're trying to build up the actual data part of the vegan food hub membership as well. So we've got about 30, I think now it's ticking about 35,000 customers, um, like 35,000 members in the vegan food hub. And um, that's through four Soul Burger restaurants in Sydney. So I think, you know, as we scale that out, we want to build that more and more and more and just have a bank of customers that we can just market to, advertise to, connect with, you know, engage with, um, and yeah, solicit feedback from. Okay, so step three. So I talked about this for a bit, which was the VFH multi-brand ordering app. So I've given ourselves a big tick there as well. So we've developed that app. The next thing, the step three is actually creating additional brands and testing them as delivery only. So, you know, it's all well and good to talk about things and say, you know, we want to build this, we want to build that. But I think the real test is actually being able to do it. And um, what we've did, what we've done with Plantis Taqueria and Zainas Lebanese is we've actually built these brands from scratch and created delivery only um, versions of them. So the delivery only versions um, of these, uh, you know, to me, like I'm, I subscribe a lot to, um, I guess, like, I don't know if people have read the lean startup, like the, the book, it's a great book, but I, I subscribe a lot to that sort of method of being really lean and testing things. And then if they don't work, just like folding them and, and not investing huge amounts of capital and, and pain and time in those things. And so for me, the delivery only um, versions of these brands is just really, really good because it allows us to test them and be like, okay, is there actual customer demand for it? Do people like it? Are our staff able to execute it properly? Um, you know, does it translate well through the kitchens? And so if it does, if we see sales growth and we see good feedback, then we can say, okay, these things are working as delivery only brands. And then, you know, what we may do, what we will do is actually build um, physical restaurants for those brands. So you can see here, step four, I've said, if the brand demand is proven, you know, we want to create customer centric, compelling physical restaurants. So um, this is this, you know, this is obviously a, like a really crude animation of like a Planus Taqueria and a Zainas Lebanese. And then the vision will be, um, you know, what we want to do is basically build a Plantis Taqueria next. And when we build that Plantis Taqueria, let's say, for example, we build it in, you know, say Marrickville or something. If we do that, then the kitchens will actually be um, have Soul Burger and Zainas Lebanese as delivery only brands operating from, from the Planus Taqueria kitchen. So what that does, it does a couple of things. The first thing is it actually gives this restaurant a base amount of revenue right away. So because Solberg has already got customers, it's already got a brand name, like a good brand name, you know, there's, there's probably customers in like, you know, Dulwich Hill or Earlwood or, or places that are maybe, you know, six kilometers from Marrickville that, that can't be reached through Glebe or Newtown restaurants as delivery brands. So immediately those customers might say, oh, awesome. Now we can order Soul Burger because, you know, we can see it on the Uber Eats app and we can see it on the VFH app as well. Um, and then the second thing is um, is that it actually, um, like it, 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 it serves as a great like revenue base for those restaurants. So they immediately plan a Stackeria will have, um, you know, a certain amount of thousand dollars a week, like however many thousands a week, just through the delivery only sales of these brands. So um, that's what we want to do is, is essentially have this customer facing 
restaurant brand, um, like we have the Soul Burger now, and then through the kitchen have delivery only versions of the brands that we have. It allows um, it allows our brands to grow really quickly. So you know we open up a Planet's Tech Race in Marrickville, and immediately you've got to, you know Soul Burger and Zayn's Lebanese now available to customers. You know within ten kilometers actually of Mar- of Marrickville. If we did that, same thing for Zayn's Lebanese. So it's it's a great way to just grow really quickly and also make de risk these restaurants by adding on revenue to them. Um, and then the kitchens are only limited by the amount of brands they can produce. So we think of the kitchens as almost like production facilities and and say to ourselves, okay, well, you know, what, like, what is, you know, the only limiting factor to these kitchens is however many, however much they can produce. And most kitchens are very underutilized. Most restaurants are busy, like 12 to two, six to eight. And then it's, it's quite underutilized. So, you know, we've found with Zayn's Lebanese and Planet's Taqueria that we've had no issues, um, even without custom built kitchens to actually work out methods to, to execute all three brands at the same time. So that's step four. Um, if, the, if brand demand is proven, we create customer-centric, compelling physical restaurants. And then step five is we convert aggregator customers to VFH members. So um, basically what we want to do is, is um, we want to almost treat Uber Eats um, and, and DoorDash and menu log marketplaces almost like a top of the funnel. And you know, they, they, we, we want customers seeing us and trying us from those platforms. And, you know, some people might be members on those platforms and just committed to using them, but we want to try and do as much as we can to win those customers to the vegan food hub platform as much as possible, because it really is a win-win. And, and that's why we advertise it on our socials as well. Now we say things like, you know, we actually add up the bill and we say, if you order this, you know, we order two burgers, fries, and two drinks from the uh, aggregators, you're going to pay $77 and 18 cents. But if you order it from us, you'll only pay 58 50. So you actually save 18 68. So, cause we want our customers to get the best value that they can. And then from our perspective, we actually don't lose any money because we're not paying any commissions. We're only paying a delivery, a flat delivery fee um, to, to a driver, which you know we offset with the delivery fee that we charge our customers. So it costs us around about six dollars per delivery. Um, whereas you know, on if you think about it, like say say on a hundred dollar order, if we ordered it from if someone ordered it from the aggregator marketplace, it, we would pay about thirty three dollars, which is like thirty percent of of a hundred dollars. Yeah, thirty three thirty three. Um, but if we ordered from the vegan food hub app, it would actually cost us the restaurant um, roughly six dollars because it would be the delivery fee that we pay the, cur- the the courier, and then minus the delivery fee we get from the customer. So yeah, six dollars versus thirty three dollars. You're talking about like a factor of five, five times cheaper if if they ordered a hundred dollar order direct from us. So that's why we want to try and convert them as much as possible. And also, um, again, about the customer data, we we don't want to be, we never want to be held hostage to an aggregator company. We always want to have our own relationship with customers. We want to have our own database of customers that we can remarket to. So these are some of the strategies like, you know, putting stickers on boxes, saying download the vegan food app to save 30% when you order directly from us. And then saying it, you know, cheaper than Uber Eats, DoorDash or Menu, like it's like the average, um, having social media advertising, um, putting it on our, this is like packaging that's coming out soon. So having it on our on our burger boxes, on our Zainas Lebanese um, kebab wraps on and also on our takeaway bags as well. Okay. And then I've got this slide of like, why we'll win. Um, so this is pretty much like the pros of our approach. So the first pro, the first big pro is multiple brands from one kitchen. So with restaurants at the end of the day, you have to make, you have to make a single restaurant profitable. Um, that restaurant has to work. You can't off. I mean, I don't really believe in like offsetting loss making restaurants with, with money making restaurants, things like that. Like I, I try and make sure that each restaurant is profitable. And if it's not profitable, then we need to figure out to make it profitable. So multiple brands from one kitchen is a great way to essentially increase labor productivity from our kitchens. Um, because it means that staff that are already there doing soul burger things, for example, for now, if someone orders Planus Taqueria, they can just, they can make Planus Taqueria. So it's not a situation like you have ghost kitchen models, which um, are different because what that normally involves is, is hiring a kitchen somewhere else and then paying for crew to like be there and, and basically, you know, be in a separate kitchen and then, you know, getting the food and everything to that separate kitchen and then paying separate rent, separate utilities. It, it's like a diff, it's almost like a dark restaurant um, and it has its own challenges. And it's, it's, you know, this is a much cleaner model because you're using all your own stuff that's already there. So, um, and then also, yeah, the, the rent and fixed overheads become much more productive. As I said, like you're paying the same rent, but you're just doing additional brands from those kitchens. And you also tend to get an increased average order frequency through multiple brands. So someone that might not want burgers three times a week might want burgers once a week and then burritos another time a week. And then if we, when we do poke away, they might want, you know, a healthier poke bowl, um, 
yeah. And then um, the other the other big thing is having multiple brands on third party apps. So um, the aggregators are still part of the model, even though you know they are like a marketing funnel for us. And we really the, the slogan I have is we don't want regular customers on Uber Eats. We want customers that are regular on Uber Eats to convert over to the VFH app. But um, in saying that, you know, we treat I treat Uber Eats almost like it's Google, and I view it as like. Um, you know, search engine optimization. So I look at Uber Eats and I say, well, they've got a Mexican category, a Lebanese category, a pizza category, an Indian category, a Chinese category. A, you know, they've got all these different categories of in cuisines. And at the moment, we've got Soul Burger in burgers, um, Plantis Taqueria in Mexican, and Zayn's Lebanese in, in Lebanese. And then we've got all three in the vegan category. And and there's just so many other categories that we can we can approach and then try and basically get our brands ranking higher and higher in those categories. Um, so yeah, it's just a way to almost hack, it's like hacking an aggregator, like basically having multiple listings on an aggregator through one restaurant. Um, and then the vegan food hub membership drives repeat revenue as well. By, you know, by owning customer data, we can continuously communicate and remarket and segment customers out. Um, and at the moment we're doing about 30% of our system revenue, um, through the VFH app, which is like really, really good compared to other restaurant groups. Um, you know, often struggle to hit 5%, like we, we hit like 30%. Um, but we want that high when it's like 50, 70%. We want it to be like the norm that when you come to a restaurant, you know, you, you're a member, you're either a member with us and you're ordering by the POS through membership, or if you order offsite, you're doing it, yeah, through the app. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at the time. Um, so market size. So yeah, the vegan market size, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's projected to be a $28 billion um, global, the, the vegan fast food industry specifically by 2033. 28 billion um, US dollars. And then you have, um, yeah, 42% of Australians either eating no meat or eating less meat in 2019. And um, the actual Australian plant-based meat spend um, uh, projected to be uh, 3 billion uh, by 2030. And then the other big market is the quick service and delivery market. So this is the market we're in, currently a $21 billion market in, in Australia. And roughly 30% um, um, of that is happening through delivery sales. Um, and then online ordering um, is also growing three times faster than dine-in sales. So we, we do really care about dine-in. Dine-in is like the most profitable part of our business. And I'm, I'm really going to like focus on getting those restaurants dine-in friendly and, and customer, you know, the ambience for customers being spot on. But I think, you know, pivoting towards making sure that you're, you've got a really good online approach is, is definitely, yeah, a really crucial part of the future. So um, in terms of market validation, um, you know, in Australia, we haven't seen like a really powerful plant-based QSR brand in the States, we're seeing it. So there's um, Slutty Vegan, which is um, a, a vegan burger brand in the States that they, they raised just one, they raised recently 25 million on like a hundred million dollar valuation um, plans to scale nationally. There's Neat Burger, which is um, I think they call it like, I think Lewis Hamilton is involved in that. Um, I think they raised a similar amount at a very similar valuation of hundred mil. Um, there's Next Level Burger, which is also another brand that's competing to be uh, a US um, like national um, vegan fast food brand. Um, there's Plant Burger, um, there's Odd Burger in Canada, and then there's Copper Chain, which is which is largely in Canada. I think I've got now a store in Melbourne as well. Um, so in terms of our growth plans by 2029, this is what we hope for. Um, as you can see, like this is Sydney, uh, Melbourne is the darker blue, Brisbane is the darkest blue, Adelaide is the light purple, and Perth is the dark purple. So as you can see, we're not going, we're not trying to go Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, like, you know, strategically not to do that. Like we've seen it so many times where brands try and go too fast, too quick, spread themselves thin, and then the quality control dies. And, you know, it's it's really bad for the brand. So we want to nail Sydney first and, and around Sydney, we've got Planus Taqueria, we've got Zanis Lebanese still to build stores for. We've got Soul Burger stores to optimize. And, you know, we've just got so much to do here first. And then when we go to Melbourne, um, you know, the plan is to really go there and then like build restaurants around, like in a very concentrated manner, not to just like, you know, sporadically build restaurants, but to have everything kind of strategically done so that we can always help each other in restaurants, use similar staff and, and just keep the quality really high. So goals by 2029 for us is 40 um, physical restaurants around Australia, um, which means 160 plus delivery only sites as well, assuming that we have roughly four delivery sites in each restaurant. It might be less at two, two to four. It might be even more, um, but I'm just, I'm roughly going to say four. We've, we've got two at each restaurant at the moment. Um, we want each restaurant doing $1.3 million plus in, in, uh, in store revenue. And then we want the group revenue hitting um, above 50 million overall. And then I've just got like a little intro on the team, which I think, you know, time is time is where it is. So I'm gonna I'll probably stop here. But yeah, I've got myself, I've got um Chris who's our consultant chef, uh former Maryvale, um, really passionate um person. Um I've got Melanie in accounts, Kyle, 
Uh, Jessie's amazing. She's um, does our brand development. So she's helped us basically helped us with Planet Stackery and Xana's Lebanese. We've got Dave doing our digital advertising. And then we've got some really, really great inv- um, advisors as well um, that are kind of like advisors to the CEO to help me, yeah, be a better CEO and, and manage the company properly. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and just for everyone's awareness, you are able to send me any further questions um, if you have any after tonight through the virtual platform. So there's a button. Um, if you haven't already expressed your interest in investing, there's a button that says send message or contact company. Um, so if you do have any further questions, you'll be able to ask them, but we'll just get stuck right into the Q&A part. And thank you for such a great presentation. I love all the colors and the visuals. In, yeah, <laughs> throughout your whole brand. Um, so I'm just going to jump into them and I'm just going by the most upvoted questions for everyone's awareness. And this one is probably one that I'll take first because it's just about more investing with virtual. So the question is from Tina and it asks um, quite a few questions in one. But first of all, how many shares are being issued? Um, what are the responsibilities and risks associated as an investor? Um, and can we buy additional shares later? And is there going to be a brochure issued? So um, just for everyone's awareness, we're currently running an expression of interest campaign, and that is to, you know, um, bring everyone along to learn more about the business that they might be investing in. And then um, we'll be heading into an offer, and an offer is when you can invest. And um, crowdsource funding is heavily regulated by ASIC, so um, there is a document called the offer document that all investors will be able to download and read when they do make an investment with Vegan Food Hub or any company on virtual for that matter. And it requires a lot of detailed information about the business. Um, So it'll cover details about plans that have already been mentioned tonight, but it'll also have more about, you know, growth plans, risks involved with investing, um, financial statements and more. So there will be a brochure available. There's also a company constitution and a subscription agreement. And um, they're really important documents for you to read also because they will outline the risk and responsibilities that an investor has um, when investing with Vegan Food Hub. So, um, you know, if you're worried about any liabilities or want to understand what would happen in particular scenarios um, with your shares, it's important to read those documents as well. Uh, In regards to buying shares later, so it's not uncommon for investors to maybe make one purchase of shares when an offer does open and then make another, um, you know, as an offer campaign comes to a close. Um, I guess, you know, in traditional um, capital raising, there is a cap on shareholders for companies, which is usually around the 50 mark. So a lot of businesses don't just take people um, in, um, you know, as a shareholder after holding capital raises. But one of the great things about crowdsource funding is that there isn't that limit with the number of shareholders that a company can bring on through this kind of funding mechanism. Um, So whether shares will be available later is dependent on many factors, but not um, usually like a quick, easy thing to buy into um, outside of crowdsource funding. Um, and then, yeah, how many shares will be issued? Um, that information will be available when we do go live with the offer. Um, so be sure to, you know, keep your eyes peeled on all the communications going forward. Um, and then you'll be able to see what the share price is and how much um, it's, you know, going to amidst looking to have invested in this company. So very long-winded answer. I was going for four questions in one, but I hope that helps everyone out. Um, We also have a virtual help center, which covers a lot of frequently asked questions we get about crowdsource funding and how this all works. So I really encourage you to go there and try and um, read a bit more if you have particular questions. And I've got that linked in the chat box. Um, Cool. Okay, so um, I haven't had a chance to read all these, so I hope I understand them as I go. But um, this one's from Neil. And it is saying, given that the core market are vegans, how is sustainability embedded in the business model? For instance, are there any initiatives to reduce food waste, use eco-friendly packaging or support local farmers? Yeah, so, um, yeah, look, I mean, being a, being a vegan brand in general is just very, very sustainable. Um, that is, I think there are often brands that, 
that there's a lot of greenwashing involved with with companies that will say things like you know that will have like minor initiatives, but their core business is actually, you know, if it's intensive animal farming, like that's just that's to, to me that's like a non-starter with sustainability. So I think I mean the answer to your question. I mean, look, I, I mean, I'll, I'll then answer it a little bit more, but I'll just say that by being a a, you know, a vegan business by, by being plant-based, like we, we tick so many of like those sustainability kind of targets already um, in terms of like the other things that we're doing. Um, but the, you know, the answer to your question is yes. Um, we definitely do. We definitely do try and do other initiatives as well. So for example, with packaging um, you know, we have um, dramatically reduced our plastic. So we, we don't even try and use um, you know, like there's like biodegradable black like query plastic that, like bioplastics that I'm not, I, you know, I haven't seen that much evidence for. So we even try and move away from them. Um, and we, we, we try and basically stick towards like, you know, cardboards and actual paper-based um, packaging as much as we can. Um, we even push our suppliers as well to like essentially pack things differently for us. So we don't have single use packaging. Cause it like, yeah, it kills me seeing like little packets of like, you know, plant-based products and you just have to tear up in a packet and you've got like 50 packets in a box. So we, we, we do that quite a bit. So eco-friendly packaging is big for us. Um, we have, we're actually going to roll out an initiative soon where you actually have a reusable burger box as well, where, you know, you can basically have your own like packaging. Um, we, we basically, we give you a burger box and then you can like reuse that and, and avoid um, for takeaways anyway, avoid um, extra packaging. Um, we use, um, we, we sort of, we use cookers for our oil, which, which has like a recycling scheme um, built in. Um, you know, we have like, we have schemes with our energy providers as well, where we actually have um, offsets in our, in our energy, energy bills. Um, what else do we do? That's, that's eco-friendly. Um, yeah. That's, I mean, it's probably, probably the main stuff. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess the answer is we really try to look wherever we can. Um, you know, we, we don't have any plastic um, water bottles or any plastic um, bottles in general in our store. So we're, 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 we're quite, we're pretty on it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's like in our DNA to, to be sustainable and, you know, to try and be a model for how we think businesses should be. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, this one's from Susan. And Susan asks, um, can we learn more about Amit and any of his experience? Um, oh, sorry, any, and any of his business partners? Um, what is your business management finance experience prior to Solberg, please? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, for me, I mean, my my background is actually in medicine. So I was um, I was actually a, a doctor when I when I took a year off and started a burger joint, and that was back in like 2012. My first my first ever restaurant that I started. So like I've been in restaurants since since like 20, 2013, really. So it's coming like on a decade for me. So I think in terms of um, yeah, and then I actually went back to med school and I did both at the same time. And it's like a long story. Uh, There's like a podcast I recently did, which um, you know you can check out um, on the Level Asian podcast. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I think I think the key things to, to to say is that you know I've been in restaurants now for like a decade. So um, specifically quick service restaurants, and I've been in plant based yeah plant based restaurants um, since 2015. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, there's, there's so much to say about that. It's, it's hard to kind of quantify what that means, but, you know, I think I'm really, I, I started as a small business owner. I still operate like a small business owner in many ways. I'm just scaling that business, but I'm very, very hands-on. So like I started, you know, with, the, as a kitchen hand now in restaurant and then the restaurant manager of my own restaurant and, and then kind of worked up to, to kind of then managing the actual business, but I'm very, very hands-on. Um, and, and yet, you know, when you're in restaurants for that long, you, you kind of, there's this restaurant operational management that is, is hard to pick up um, quickly. And it's, it's something that takes quite a bit of time. So, yeah, I mean, that's really kind of my, my kind of experience around it. Um, uh, yeah. Like, you know, that many, that many years and, and overseeing the brands and, and building and kind of navigating through, you know, a bunch of challenges and, and all that kind of thing. Um, in terms of um, business partners, we don't have—I don't have any business partners in the business um, um, uh, operationally. Um, we do have—we um, do have advisors that are that are quite like really good. Um, you know, both of them very very experienced, and yeah, I find them super helpful um, helping me around sort of you know more kind of higher level like you know like cash flow forecasting and and tracking um, outcomes and how you hold yourself accountable to what you say you're going to do and, and how you track the success of things. Yeah. That's, that's probably the best I would say. Um, I mean, otherwise about me, I mean, what else was, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm basically like an evangelist for this thing. Like, you know, I really, really believe in um, 
you know, trying to build a business that can help catalyze our food culture away from eating animals, um, you know, intensively farmed animals, especially, but really move it towards, um, you know, plant-based eating and, and eating, you know, animal meat alternatives. Like that's what I really care about. And it just happens to be that, you know, um, I guess the, the form I've chosen is restaurants. I could imagine myself in a, another kind of space, but doing a similar thing. Um, but yeah, I love hospitality and, you know, this is kind of like, I guess the, the vision for me, you know, this is the way I want to make an impact on this, on this kind of scene. And, and I hope that, you know, the vegan food hub plays like a part, um, in actually catalyzing other restaurants and, and like a national change in, in how we eat. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this one's from Joshua and Joshua's asked, why have you decided to use crowdsource funding instead of venture capital? And um, are you able to talk a little bit about who might be existing investors in Vegan Food Hub already? Yeah, sure. So um, the reason, so with restaurants, there's really like four ways to grow with restaurants, right? There's, there's franchising, which is how most restaurants grow, which is where you would basically allow someone else to spend capital to build a restaurant. And then you would charge them like a license fee in, a, in essence, like a franchise fee. And you grow that way. Um, the second way is through VC funding um, or, you know, some sort of, yeah, probably VC funding. The third way is um, through, or not just VC funding, but external capital funding. So maybe high net worth investors and things like that. The third way is um, just funding off your own cash flow. So, um, you know, basically trying to, um, yeah, you know, be, I guess, be, be cash flow positive enough to actually build restaurants by yourself without any external funding. And then the, th the fourth way is um, like, you know, different kinds of capital raises like this, which is, which is crowd equity funding. So if you think about those alternatives, so with VC funding, we have actually reached out to different, like, you know, VC funding was the first thing that I thought of because that's what a lot of startups do. And that's what a lot of restaurants, you know, a lot of businesses do that. Um, you know, when I saw some of the term sheets and stuff, I, 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 you know, I, I didn't, I, I found it like, I found it a little bit too aggressive sometimes. Like it, it felt, I think the way some VC firms work is, you know, they might pick sort of, if there's like 10, if there's 10 restaurants, they might pick 10, so, sorry, 10 different businesses. You know, they, they're expecting to really get one of those businesses to win really, really big. So that funds the cost of the, the nine losses. And that's often the way VC funding works. And so it ends up, you end up in this situation where you have to like grow, 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 grow. And, and that's just not the way I want to do it. You know, we're trying to build like an institutional company, you know, we want to build a company that is you know, an amazing, like an amazing business that's around for a long time. And that, that involves sustainable growth. Like I'm not in the business of wanting to grow that aggressively at losses and take these massive risks and things like that. So VC funding, I just didn't find it the right fit franchising. We have actually franchised the restaurant and um, yeah, I mean, we've been lucky with our franchisee. Um, but I think in general, I think franchising is getting harder and harder um, for a few reasons, but delivery is a big part of it. You know, margins in restaurants are not what they were like 30 years ago or 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. Um, delivery fees have really changed franchising. And I think franchising now is probably food-wise is most suitable to really large revenue businesses like McDonald's and, you know, the GYGs, like really mass market um, really high revenue type businesses. Whereas I think the businesses that are more kind of circa 1 million revenue per restaurant a year um, are really struggling that I've seen with franchise models. It, you, you end up with franchisees that are disgruntled and not happy because, you know, they need to, they need to earn what they need to earn. And then you end up with restaurants trying to, you know, you know, pay for their franchisee and, and it, it becomes a bit of a battle. So decided deciding not to franchise um anymore and 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 also the, you know control as well like you just get a lot more control if it's your if it's a company and restaurant um and then the other two sort of pieces are either cash flow funding or or different capital raises so cash flow funding we could do that but the thing with restaurants is that they are capital intensive so when you build a restaurant you're looking at sort of something like about two hundred sixty thousand dollars each restaurant that you build and um that's just not you're not going to be able to build at the rate you want to build just through cash flow. It's it's going to be very, very hard to make that work. So that's why if I look at something and then, you know, you have other capital raises. So we've done um, like safe note raises. We've raised money off like high, high net worth individuals through, through safe notes previously um, when the business like, you know um, yeah. And, and basically that um, that's one method. Um, but I, I, I guess I really like crowd equity funding because, you know, we're one of those rare businesses that actually has, 
like a purpose, like a genuine purpose and a community around it. And so for me, the idea of a community owning a part of a business and kind of going on, on that journey with that business and then potentially, you know, benefiting from, from a liquidity event with that business. I think that's, that's a very cool thing. And it's, it's like what we want to do. We want to have employee ownership, having customer ownership. Like these are things that we want to do because that's like our business is, you know, serving the community. And, and I think the community owning a part of it is, is a good thing. So, um, and also, I also think it, it probably it, it's there's I mean, it's anecdotal, but I've heard that it's a it's a useful thing to have customers as investors because you're more in, you're more invested in the business. And you're more passionate about it. And if we let you down somehow, you know, you're more likely to reach out and say, hey, you know, this happened and because you're you're actually a shareholder in it. So I feel like it's a great alignment of interests. Yeah, I was just going to add to that and say we do find a lot of companies who do raise on virtual and do it quite well are the ones that have that engaged audience who are already very loyal to the brand and love what they're doing um, have the first-hand experience and now obviously want to own a part of the business as well so oftentimes that's how people feel like there's a good alignment and fit um, but the next question, I'm not entirely clear on the question, but I'll try my best. So Jennifer is saying um, there's currently an average wait time of 60 to 70, 75 minutes for delivery across the brands. I'm not sure if that's big in food hub brands or maybe I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I imagine that wouldn't work with competitors. How are you planning to upscale with more drivers? So I'm just not entirely clear on the question, but if you think you That's could- That's okay, I'm, answer. I'm clear on the question. Yeah, I know what Jennifer's talking about. Okay. So yeah, so um, no, it's a great question. And um, basically, look, it's it's a, it's actually a technology, um, it's a technology flaw within the app. So we need to give customers a guideline as to when they're going to reach their, when they're going to get their orders. And so we've got a set premeditated guideline of 60 to 75 minutes. When you actually order, that's when you'll get dynamic um, timelines. That's when it'll, you'll actually get a timeline that'll say your food is, you know, 50 minutes away or it's 70 minutes away or it's 40 minutes away. So that's that's really the answer to that question. It's it's actually not 60 to 75 minutes on average. It's just the guideline that we give to kind of protect ourselves in the event that if it does kind of blow out, we, we've got a guideline in place to kind of protect us. But um, it's, 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 a, it's kind of like a short-term solution, um, but what we really want to get towards is a dynamic timeline right from the beginning is, is the answer to that question. So we want to have like immediately as you order it, you know, you have a, a rough, like, like a basically an ETA that's kind of dynamic depending upon where the driver is and, you know, through GPS tracking. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, it, it is about courier numbers and stuff in Sydney as well. And it's, it's why we're also partnering with Uber direct, which is Uber's version of um, white label delivery. So basically getting on look i mean the reality is most doordash couriers are uber couriers and vice versa like they tend to do more than one thing but uber is the most popular um delivery aggregator platform and that's why we're really keen on getting uber direct as part of our system as well so once we can get uber direct integrated with our system as well there's going to be potentially more couriers because there are some uber drivers that aren't um uber couriers that aren't doordash couriers um, and once we get those two in, we'll just have a bigger fleet of couriers. Um, we've actually tried, and, and, you know, the, you know, delivery is so hard. We've tried, you know, having our own drivers. We tried using our own, um, like delivery sort of marketplace and stuff. And I don't know if people remember that a couple of years, like it was like two years ago. Or so it, it is so, so hard. There's reason, you know, that's why we decided not to have our own drivers and, and start using these third-party aggregator white label solutions, because, you know, having that customers are used to seeing GPS tracking, wanting immediate customer support, immediate help and getting their food quickly. And unless you're Domino's and you've got like that level of scale and tech and, and restaurants, it's just, it's really, really hard to make work. And that's why, um, you know, I think, I mean, I, I actually, I'm really optimistic about this. I think when, you know, once we get the dynamic kind of delivery times, um, it'll help a lot because it'll give you a real time. And then the second thing is once we get Uber direct on board as well, we'll have, you know, many many more couriers as well so yeah um so that's from laura and laura is asking what controls are in place to ensure quality control is across all the franchises so um laura is a customer and she said you know she's noticed some differences between newtown and Parramatta. Yeah. Um, so yeah curious yeah um look that's that's a great question and 
it's partially why we want to corporate like corporately own stores and have more control over it. Not that it's, you know, one store or another, but um, we're, we're actually in the process at the moment of, you know, we, we could have built more restaurants after we got to four and then we didn't because one, you know, we saw what was happening with delivery and COVID and that's where the vegan food hub iteration came in. But two as well, because we don't want, exactly this thing to happen we don't want inconsistencies between stores and different processes with different managers and things like that and it's going to happen unless we have like a strong system in place so we are developing those systems like we've we've got we've just we've just developed like this dynamic training manual um for a group called trainial which is basically like an online sop portal where people can immediately see exactly how burgers are made and what to put in each burger and that kind of thing and we've also just um, hired someone as well to start doing orientations with with crew members and and basically do more and more training. I think the answer to this question is, you know, it's it's really all about systemizing and standardizing operations, and then training crew, and then making sure that managers are enforcing those standards. It's just much easier said than done. Um, it, it it will be done. It is largely being done, but um, because you know you end up. You, you, because you've, you're doing so many, like you're doing thousands of burgers a week and you've got different crew in and out and stuff, it, it can be difficult to maintain, but that's what the best brands do. The best brands, you know, do quality control that way. So I guess the answer to that question is one, we want to maintain, that's why we want to maintain like some kind of complete control as we grow and not, and not have this kind of, yeah, independent owner sort of model with, with franchising that that's one reason that that's one reason is the quality control. And the second thing is um, really kind of, continuing to build those um, dynamic um, systems manuals um, and then having that, you know, the, the person we have now to to do training and really kind of audit restaurants as they're going along. Um, yeah, that's that's probably the main ways of doing it. And then I'll just say the last thing as well is we've, we've started using contract kitchen manufacturing much, much more now, which is what a lot of the larger groups do. And that's largely around consistency. So um, you know, the marinations that we have for Plantis Taqueria, the different sources that we have, they're actually um, often contract manufactured away from the restaurants and not made in the stores anymore. And they're just kind of sent in. So that way it's like all quality controlled through a contract manufacturer and they'll just like send it in through to the kitchen. So we want that. We want, we want a system really where you're not really making anything in the restaurant as such anymore, that it's all being made outside in a contract kitchen and it's like sent in and it's like really low kind of labor use. You just kind of like open it, take it out. It's all made like the day before or the day it depends. And, and then it's just like, yeah, it's like super consistent. Um, you might've touched on this one before, but Anna's asking like, is the vegan food hub 100% vegan? So does this account include your packaging? Um, are you confident that you know, there's no animal testing and everything's cool, cruelty free. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we try to the best of our ability. So when it comes to food, um, yes, for, you know, obviously a hundred percent, there's no animal products in the food when it comes to, um, when it comes to packet, I mean, yeah, when it comes to the different products in the kitchen and especially when it, when it comes to things that are like, real staples um and and hard to source elsewhere i mean i can't say that we've looked at every um like every detergent or every soap bottle that we have um it's definitely going to be part of the the process though as we because at the moment we we have diver like we don't have standardized suppliers for all of our restaurants for, for every single um sort of non-food ingredient so somewhere you know Parramatta might be picking up different stuff to Newtown might be picking up different stuff to Randwick in around say cleaning restaurants and things like that um, but we do want to get to a point where you know all of that stuff is standardized and through one supplier so at the moment I mean yeah when you say 100% vegan it makes me like nervous like I don't want to say yes to that because I haven't I haven't audited all the different um, you know uh, ingredients of, of uh, like cleaning products things like that I haven't done that um, food, I can, I can hundred percent say yes to, um, but I can tell you, we'll, you know, we hundred, we'd be moving there for sure. Like we, everything we standardized and kind of have as a, as a supplier, um, norm ordering, like, a, a, a product of ours, so to speak, like on our kind of portal for managers to order from that would, yeah, that would pass that test. Um, that's from Francis and it says, um, I see your expansion does not include Canberra. 
a high disposable, high, it, it might be a suggestion rather, but um, a high yeah. disposable income, high vegan population will yeah. can be considered in your expansion. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So when I said Sydney, I, sh I should have said Sydney slash ACT. So yeah, excuse that on the pitch deck. It's it's definitely um, definitely part of the plans. I mean, these these like, when I say these suburbs, like it's not set in stone. Like it, we, what we'll end up doing is we'll end up probably working with a, like a property consulting group that would give us kind of demographics, population densities, spending habits and things like that before we actually choose a location. But off the top, yeah, Canberra is like a very obvious place to be. So yeah, excuse that definitely is the answer. Excellent. We'll see you there, Francis. <laughs> um, this one is from Andre and it's kind of touching on some similar questions that we've had before, but it's um, asking, um, how, how is the food safety managed with all the different brands in the kitchen? Um, this might be more in relation to allergies and specific dietaries and how, all the different brands and cuisines that you're preparing. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, um, in terms of allergens, we'll, we have like an out, we actually about a week away from having like a really clear um, collated allergen sheet. So um, all the brands, essentially will have, you know, their products with all the common allergens, the nu nutritional um, inputs in each of those things, as well as, um, as well as like basic ingredients as well, just in case there's something that is not a common allergen that you're allergic to, like someone that came in that was like allergic to tomatoes, for example, that, that wouldn't be under the common allergens normally. Um, in terms of um, how food safety is managed in the kitchen with all different brands. So um, I think the, the reason this works um, for us at the moment so well is because a lot of the brands have a lot of the base inputs the same. So for example, Plantis Taqueria, you know, we use like a plant-based um, beef for that, right? And then those plant-based beef strips are also used for Soul Burgers Halal Snack Packs, um, as well as for Zainas Kebabs. But the difference is, is that the marinations are different. So the carne asada will have a carne asada marination that'll be done, um, that'll be done for Plantis Taqueria. And then it's stored in like a separate part of the Bain Marie. So it's like, that's, that's for Plantis Taqueria, that's for Soul Burger, that's for Zainas. So that's that's the way it'll work. So it's it's actually um, the way you know because things are made off site and because contract ca contract kitchens are involved in in the marinations, um, it's actually quite separate in the kitchen. Like the the brands don't normally cross collaborate that way. But in saying that, um, you know, if they do cross collaborate because everything is plant based, you know, we know we don't have to worry about you know that level of like avoiding things. But what we have common allergies like you know what we you know we have depending on the product and if it has a common allergen or it doesn't have a common allergen we we cook it separately and we kind of separate it out that way um we are going to wrap up soon just because we've only got an hour booked in here but we'll ask we'll ask one or two more questions um this one's from Derek and Derek's asking do you have any metrics on whether vegans repeat buy quick service restaurants uh is this why you're looking to, at having multiple styles in the kitchens? Because one brand would not sustain repeated. Oh, okay, so yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. More um, variety, obviously. <laughs> yeah, so I think the first thing is most of our customers aren't vegan, actually. Um, we we get that all the time. Like we, I mean, it's hard to say for sure, for sure, because, you know, there's no like, I don't know, there's no, there's no button you click to say you're vegan or not. But No survey can, when they walk through the door. <laughs> Yeah, what I can tell you is whenever we do like in-person stuff, whenever we just ask people um, and we do it quite a bit, like spot check quite a bit, it, it's almost inevitably like eight out of 10 are not vegan or vegetarian. So um, that's kind of just for starters in terms of why we're looking to have, um, you know, vegans repeat buying QSR. So we we have much more repeat purchasing, like the average of our repeat purchasing as per our membership data is is much higher than a regular brand. So vegans specifically i don't know but i can tell you about um our customers i can tell you our customers repeat purchase quite a bit um with soul burger it's it's much higher than the norm and i imagine it probably is around dietary I imagine it probably is because you know we offer something that they might not be able to get somewhere else or we offer it in a better way than they get it from somewhere else um why we're looking at multiple styles in the kitchen because one brand would not sustain repeat purchases i wouldn't say one brand would not sustain repeat purchases i would just say because it's it's like it's just a better model you know it's it's just a way for us to be even more profitable and and have higher revenues and serve a greater market of customers and a more diverse range of customers. So I just view it as a way to future proof and 
like really kind of optimize a site. You know, if you think about it just from an efficient efficiency perspective, you'd say, well, you know, how can I get the most out of this kitchen? And I think with the rise of like digital ordering and deliveries, that's why you have this whole industry of like ghost kitchens, virtual brands, um, you know, dark, you know, dark kitchens and, and so on. Like it all, it all stems from the notion of one, suddenly a restaurant is not necessarily brick and mortar anymore. You can create an online shop you're the same way you have an online retail shop. You can do that now for a food brand because you've got drivers and you've got, um, and then you've got digital ordering. So for me, it's just like looking at that and then saying, you know, Soul Burger really isn't a, a burger brand. It's actually a plant-based brand that does burgers. And and when I made that connection, it was like, okay, this is so obvious. Like, why are we not doing all these other brands? Like, why are we just sticking to just burgers within plant-based food? Like, why aren't we tackling all the other QSI cuisines that, frankly, use the same kitchens, um, same grill, same cooking equipment, you know, exhaust hood, deep fries, same thing. Um, and, you know, the the base of what we do, like the proteins, the sources, like that's the hardest thing. So we're already doing that. We're already doing it plant-based. That's the hardest thing. So you can then kind of just iterate that to different cuisine types and, and yeah, create new brands out of it. Um, this may be the last question for the evening, but um, if you would like to, we can like I can send you all the questions and we can try and get back to more people after this webinar. Um, the last one will be from Andre and he's asking, can you explain the staffing model? So I'm not sure if that's in relation to the, just um, the presentation. The different brands and stuff. Or yeah, maybe something yeah. a bit more in depth. Yeah, I guess it depends what you mean by the staffing model. Like what I, I mean, yeah, in terms of the brands, so the staff learn all the brands. And and the and it sounds like it'd be really complicated, but because we do so much contract kitchen um, work for these different brands, it's actually really not that difficult at all. It's it's um it's quite. I mean, we could we generally we generally train staff in like two to three weeks. Um, so um that's that's from that side. And then otherwise, I guess the way I envision these restaurants is, you know, we we want like a customer centric person in the front. We want someone that's willing to engage with customers and guide them around ordering and really encourage QR code ordering. Are you a member with us? Sign them up. Like we really want that happening to try and increase the VFH membership revenue. And then otherwise in the kitchen, um, you know, it's all about being super efficient. You know, it's like the way we've set up our kitchens is that, you know, we can be like highly, high, like our, our labor is much more productive, I'd say, than other restaurants that I've seen because they're like small kitchens. Everything's within arm's length. Um, there's multiple brands coming out from, from you know, we've got everything integrated. So like the back of the house um, kitchen video monitor will have like Solberger, you know, Plantis, Zaynes. It's all kind of automatically coming into the kitchen. There's no manual entering. There's no receipt dockets. So it's all just like super efficient. Yeah, so I think I, I think that's how I'd explain the staffing model, and and I otherwise we do it on on a percentage of revenue for a, a percentage for revenue. So you know we try and aim for like roughly twenty eight percent of of our of our um of our revenue is is allocated towards in store labor. So that's that's the efficiency we aim for. Awesome, thank you. Um, well, that's what we've got time for tonight. Um, so thank you, Amit, for giving such a great presentation and answering all those questions. Um, and thank you to everyone who has joined this evening. We'll definitely try and get back to you and answer all those questions that we didn't get through. Um, but also you're welcome to reach out to Amit through the virtual platform, as mentioned before. Um, we're still in the expression of interest um, phase of this campaign, but please um, make sure you keep an eye on your emails and you're staying posted about when the offer opens up because we'll be sure to let you know. Um, and then, yeah, a big perk of expressing your interest and being one of the first people to invest is not only being, and you know, one of the first crowdsource funding investors in this company, but also you get delayed payment terms with virtual. Um, and yeah, you're the first to know about when it's going live and to get in. So please stay posted, um, become familiar with the types of shares you're purchasing by reading um, what but the information virtual has and also reading those documents that will be available when the offer opens. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone and hope you have a good evening and good night, Amit. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Zoe. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye.